What's up, peers, and welcome to join the Wasabikas, a Bitcoin privacy podcast. My name is Max Hillebrand, and today I sit down with the one and only Ben Kaufmann, uh, who is a bright, young, economical thinking mind in the Bitcoin rabbit hole. Uh, and he has articulated his understanding of the praxeology and, and use cases of a vast number of Bitcoin specific uh, topics in many articles uh, and blog posts. Uh, but he's not just a excellent Bitcoin philosopher. He's actually a coder too. Uh, and he contributes uh, or contributed to many good Bitcoin projects in the past, including, for example, the BISC decentralized exchange. But most noteworthily, and our topic of today's conversation, the Spectre multi signature wallet. Uh, it's, this is really one of the awesome projects that I've been eyeballing at, uh, since a long time as it combines three awesome things. First, a very elegant Bitcoin full node integration. So you have all the privacy, the security and the verification of your own Bitcoin full node together with a beautiful user interface to manage multi signature wallets with all uh, the advanced nuances that come with it packaged nicely to look at and to actually use. And finally, the hardware wallet integration so that it works together even with a multi hardware wallet uh, device. Uh, multi-signature so that you really take away a lot of potential attack vectors like supply chain attacks uh, or just one hardware wallet provider being malicious. Uh, this is really a, a massive step forward in the Bitcoin wallet ecosystem. And they continue even further, right, with staying up to date with the most cutting edge technology like output script descriptors, mini script, and hopefully soon Taproot as well. Right, so there are numerous nice nuggets in our conversation following right here. So if you like uh, this type of content, share it with your friends and do leave a like uh, on YouTube so that more people find this beautiful knowledge to accumulate. Uh, thank you very much for listening and stay tuned uh, for this content coming up right now. So, Ben, I'm really happy that we get to talk today uh, because uh, you've really made a splash in, in the Bitcoin contribution space recently. Uh, and I'm eager to get you uh, here on that call just to you know, explore a bit about your background and uh, your motivations uh, and the projects that you work on right now. So, so thanks for joining us today. Yeah, sure. Thank you for inviting me. Cool. Uh, so first off, like, how did you first get in touch with free software? What kind of pulled you in? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I just I started uh, software development like five years ago. Um, basically, just uh, it started from like kids coding class, and then just um, you know some boot camp, and then I just uh, learned by myself uh, the rest. Um, with free software um, specifically, I think it was kind of along with Bitcoin. So um, I. Basically, when I started um, looking into Bitcoin, I also discovered all the all the world of, of free open source software. So before that, I mean, I knew what GitHub was. I was using it for you know um, uh, when I do uh, when I did freelance stuff, but I didn't really get much into uh, open source development. Uh, but Bitcoin quite uh, encouraged me, let's say, to to start uh, looking into that. And when I uh, learned more about Bitcoin and I wanted to start, uh, first of all, giving back to the community and getting more involved with stuff, then uh, starting with open source contributions was obviously the go-to. Nice. That's great. So uh, it kind of like the, the you first started out as a user to free software, basically, right? using mm -hmm. Bitcoin and all the, the wallet magic. Um, I, I wonder, do you, are you also using free software outside of the Bitcoin specific realm? So like for, of course, like your operating system or your development environment? Um, so usually no. So it's just, uh, just easier to use this, um, you know, to use a Mac for me at least. Um, uh, but I do, I do see like the value in that and I try to, when, when I have free time, I try to practice with, uh, you know, uh, with, um, with more open source software and try to set up things to be as much private. So, for example, I try to to set up the uh, embassy from Start Nine Labs, uh, just giving it easier to you know to self host some stuff. Uh, and just you know, I'm more experimenting with with everything, but I just don't have uh, much time to get used to uh, the the open source tools. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, uh, I'm curious because I mean, you know, that's uh, that's the beauty of free software, uh, specifically your mm-hmm. contributions to the projects that you actually use yourself uh, to scratch your own itch. Uh, so it's it's awesome that you t- take mm-hmm. this opportunity of you know using Bitcoin and contributing back and clearly making it better for everyone, uh, as we see with Spectre Wallet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it just it's just a matter of priorities, I guess. So it just helps me uh, do stuff faster. Uh, I'll probably get to that eventually, but it just takes time. Mm-hmm. So w- what interests you in Bitcoin? What what got you into that rabbit hole? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so first of all, I just heard of Bitcoin from a from friend who was just asking me, wanted to ask some technical questions, see if I know anything about it. Uh, so it kind of got me curious and they started reading a lot about it, uh, how it works, what it is. Uh, I guess that one of the things that got my attention first is that it's, you know, it's, you, you, nobody can stop you. It's, it's uncensorable. Uh, and at the time I was having a lot of trouble with, with banks because I was underage and I was working as a freelancer and it was basically a nightmare with banks. They want to let you, uh, get money in, but they don't want to let you, uh, get it out of the, of your account. Uh, and they do like, uh, they can do a lot of troubles if you're underage. So that was, you know, seeing that there is money that I can control and nobody can censor me, nobody can uh, withhold my account. Then, yeah, I, I pretty much uh, understood the value of that. Yes, that's awesome. And, and just a confirmation of what we spoke earlier, right? That you scratch your own itch and that's the same mindset that led you into using Bitcoin. Because, well, you were censored, right? Uh, just because of your bodily age, somehow, even mm-hmm. though you're a productive person, right? Helping out uh, other people in the economy, a great entrepreneur, even at a young age, right? Which is fantastic. No, uh, the, the bureaucrats throw in a lot of uh, permissions and requirements that you have to fulfill just to be, you know, acknowledged uh, as an entrepreneur and as a contributor, which is, of course, mm-hmm. ridiculous. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, awesome. So, uh, here then, of course, uh, you got into Bitcoin then also just by earning Bitcoin, I guess, right? Because people paid you in Bitcoin, I presume. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So at first, uh, until I had Bitcoin, then no, but, um, at first I was kind of hesitant, but, uh, so it didn't like was instantly, but with time, yes. Then I started, especially as I got more into Bitcoin related jobs. Yeah, and what has your experience been like there right, to to try to get paid in Bitcoin? With what type of projects did you succeed there? Yeah, so I do mostly software development projects. Uh, so there it's usually uh, pretty, uh, it's not that hard, especially if the, if it's uh, somebody from abroad and then comparing to banks, then transferring Bitcoin as payment is easier for them uh, to usually, so, you know. Uh uh-huh. Here again, right? Use case and convenience. Mm-hmm. <laughs> International bank uh, t- wire transfers take forever uh, and cost a lot of time in settlement. Right? Um, mm-hmm. While Bitcoin is compared to that instant, right? Regardless for from where remotely you work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Uh huh. Really, really interesting. Um, so, what were some of the Bitcoin specific projects that you contributed to initially? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I think one of the first that I started contributing a bit to was BISC. Uh, I don't know to tell you about that, but for just for users who, uh, just for listeners who might not know it, uh, BISC is this decentralized exchange for uh, Bitcoin. Uh, so it's completely decentralized. Um, you can pay there with lots of, lots of payment options. And it's basically the, the, the whole point is just to cut any single point of failure in finding Bitcoin liquidity. Yeah, BISC is absolutely an, a fascinating project. And frankly, we have not yet even talked about it at the Was Obikas podcast. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I still want to make like a dedicated standalone episode on that because it really is a fascinating trading protocol uh, that again mm-hmm. relies on, you know, self sovereignty. You run your own BISC node and that is part of a Bitcoin peer to peer network. Uh, that uh, offers and discovers and takes upon uh, trades uh, to buy and sell Bitcoin for whatever other asset you would like. Uh, it's it's really, mm-hmm. really a fascinating protocol. So w- what did you contribute to BISC specifically? 
Uh, just small, uh, small contributions to fix something small there, uh, some script stuff, uh, but nothing major, I'd say. Uh-huh. Uh, and how did you discover those problems to fix? Were, was there something that you stumbled upon in your everyday use case? Uh, no. So it's quite hard. So in Israel, at least, uh, where I'm based, then it's not really a major thing, this, because Practically all the payment options are non-available in Israel and peer-to-peer -peer there are uh, other uh, bigger platforms, I'd say, in Israel. Uh, but I was just kind of uh, wanting to, to find a project to contribute to. So I was going through issues uh, and also trying to set it up myself. I also stumbled upon a few issues. Uh, so, yeah, I fixed that too. Aha, so that's interesting. You, you didn't really end up using BISC a lot just because of lack of local liquidity. But nevertheless, mm -hmm. just because it was a cool project, it was still worth your time to improve it for everyone else, even though you were not the user of it directly. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Yeah, so, so that's kind of a divergence of the scratch your own itch ethos, right? Uh, and I think <laughs> absolutely justified just by the, by the awesome scope of BISC, right? And maybe, you know, still, if BISC further improves and improves and improves, especially if you as a local Israeli and part of the community start building it and fostering it, and maybe eventually BISC will, will achieve quite liquidity uh, in your local area when then ultimately you can start using it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, so right now it's just that all the payment options are quite uh, difficult because no, most of the payment options are not, not available in Israel. Uh, so, and there are peer to peer markets, uh, that are quite developed, I would say. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I think eventually, uh, it, it might also catch up there. Okay, cool. Uh, and where, where did you go after developing to, uh, or contributing to BISC? What was the next project? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I don't remember exactly. If, I, I'm pretty sure that the next project was right away Spectre. Uh, maybe it was like a few months between where I was more focusing on writing some articles. But uh, after that, I think it was uh, Spectre, which, which you worked on. Yeah, you know, actually, before we go into Spectre, let's touch on that other aspect of yours, basically the Bitcoin philosopher <laughs> uh, and, <laughs> and wizard to educate people. Like, why is that so important to you? Because you're very much good at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was uh, writing a few articles just at first because I was reading a lot of Austrian economics uh, and other books, and I was just trying to consolidate my own understanding of stuff. So I was trying to kind of explain it how I would explain to myself, kind of, uh, just to to make sure that uh, I I understand it properly. So, and you know, if if I write it anyway, then why not share this with with others? Um, but also I think it's, it's really important to, to help as many people understand this stuff, uh, get more in, more into, uh, the philosophy of Bitcoin. Yeah. Great, great points, right? Both that, that first of all, you want to learn it for yourself, right? And just listening to some other people speak won't make that happen, right? You got to act yourself. Either think about it really hard uh, and writing about something is a nice way to think about it. And so th this is what can help you to grasp the very complex topic of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, that helps a lot. Yeah. So w why Austrian economics? Uh, wh what was that rabbit hole like for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So at first they started with a few like, um, not exactly Austrian, but uh, somebody somewhat leaning to that uh, area. So uh, um, Thomas Sowell, for example, which is obviously he's not an Austrian, but he's not that far from the, from from Austrians, I'd say. Um, and others are similar. Uh, after reading a few of these, I also uh, saw Safety's book, of course, and that really got me uh, towards the Austrian school. Uh, so then starting to, to explore that, I think it, it gives a very, very compelling argument for Bitcoin. Uh, even though many Austrians don't really like Bitcoin, I, I still think it gives a very strong argument for it. Yeah, I very much agree. And so it's, it's nice that Bitcoin kind of help, helped you to do, be curious about the economics tradition, right? And to further dive deeper, uh, in, into other ways of explaining it, like Austrian economics. Uh, that's nice and good that you followed up with it. 
uh, how did you experience like the how learning the Austrian school of economics helped you in in everyday life? Like, how was this school of thought useful to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So first of all, understanding why uh, why Bitcoin only matters. So before I was uh, focusing on Bitcoin, uh, I was logging to shit coins too. I'll have to admit that. Uh, but once I started reading Austrian economics, so first of all, Safety's book, which really helped with that, uh, and others too, then you start to understand that, okay, money doesn't work the, the, this way. Money is not, you know, uh, a lot of shit coins competing each other. That's still barter. That doesn't make sense. Uh, money is, uh, you know, a kind of a winner takes it all. And it, once you understand why Bitcoin is the best money, then it, it makes sense to just focus on it. Uh huh. Yeah, right. Really, it it reshaped your focus on what the most important problem to solve is. It mm -hmm. helped you to realize that Bitcoin is the most beautiful solution to this biggest problem, and that is to have a sound monetary system. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So let let's get a bit spacey here. Where do you think uh, like the Bitcoin mindset and the Bitcoin ethos uh, will will take us in a couple of years? Um. So it's it's hard to say. I I'm somewhat into the the thesis of the sovereign individual i would say so probably we'll see uh, a lot of small uh, small sovereign keys uh, trying to to start to compete for for bitcoiners or you know wealthy individuals but i think in five years that would be bitcoiners <laughs> usually so yeah i i think um, in terms of that, uh, right now you see that the governments, nation states, especially the bigger ones, are just completely uh, screwing up their citizens, I would say, and trying to trap them in. Uh, Australia, England, Israel too, uh, all trying to make it illegal to get out of the country, basically. Um, and yeah, so I, I think, and everybody is making this all uh, authoritarian shit show. So yeah, I, I just think that for, uh, it would be very, very profitable for small sovereignties uh, to offer this this escape uh, for um, for some individuals who are seeking that. Yeah, I agree. Right, the security of of your meat space is very important, and being trapped into a certain region uh, based on on the local dictators is is quite a bad situation. And so we're basically talking about citadels here, right? So so what are your plans mm -hmm. for your own citadel? Yeah, I've, I still don't know yet. So I'm practically uh, at the process of of leaving Israel, but I still have no idea where where I'll go. At least not uh, not long term. So I'm still exploring stuff, still looking for things to go to. Uh, but um, I, right now I don't have any like long-term plans. I'm just trying to figure them out right now. Yeah, I think this is one of the great business opportunities in the Bitcoin realm. And to, to build a network of citadels and secure travel in between them, I, uh, I'm still thinking that that might be one of the big projects worth contributing to. Yes, yes, for sure. That's that's going to be a major thing, I think. Yeah, that will be fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, of, of course, right, when, when we look uh, at Bitcoin Citadels, we try to get people together, right? And um, sharing the ownership over some Bitcoin <laughs> is a very interesting <laughs> thing. And, of course, we can do that with Bitcoin multi-signatures. And this is the, the beautiful segue <laughs> from Citadels <laughs> uh, into Spectre Wallet. So finally, we arrive here. Uh, like, what makes you so interested in Spectre Wallet? Why did you start contributing to it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so my I think one of my last articles was about how, why it's so important to, to use a full node. So again, I was writing in order to grasp things myself. So as I started writing about it and uh, researching about it, I kind of quite understood why it's so important that everybody use their own full node, uh, not just for privacy, but also, of course, for their own privacy, but also in terms of the entire network. So if uh, this um, the payment verification of, of Bitcoin, of how you verify if you have Bitcoin or not, if uh, a transaction is valid or not, uh, is too centralized. If this verification becomes too centralized, then Bitcoin becomes very, very vulner vulnerable uh, to uh, attacks from either uh, big actors like nation states 
or from collaboration between these uh, payment ver uh, verification uh, providers. So as I was researching that, uh, I was also looking on a way to use my uh, my own node um, uh, with you know with hardware wallets with multisig. Uh, I was just trying to, to figure that out, and there was Electrum pretty much. I think only that <laughs> at the time, and it was working, but it was very very annoying and very inconvenient for me, I would say at least. Um, Especially when you didn't have this node in a box thing, uh, back then. So, yeah, so Electrum was quite annoying to, to work with. So I was looking for alternatives. Yeah. And then I just, uh, kind of stumbled upon Spectre on, on Twitter and saw a video of, uh, Stepan making, um, multi seed with, with hardware wallets with your own node in like, uh, two minutes. So I was, I, I had just had to try it out and it was, so easy to set up for me and you know i just started using it practically immediately uh and then yeah I just you know scratch your own niche at first so i was i wanted to to have some feature or fix some bug so i just did it myself um and it kind of escalated from that to uh working on this project now uh pretty much full time very interesting so you bring up like three big points that spectre is addressing Right, the full node integration, the multi-signature, and the hardware wallet integration. Let's dive down into all three of them, uh, and let's start with the full node. You already mentioned why it's important, right? Uh, just for security that you verify for yourself how much Bitcoin you have, and that you don't have to trust someone else to tell you how much money you have, and specifically that you don't reveal any sensitive information about how much money you have to that other full node that you're asking. Right, so how does Spectre actually solve the problem? How does Spectre use the Bitcoin Core client? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, of course you can always use the Bitcoin Core client, but then it doesn't have uh, many features. So it doesn't uh, support multi-sig from the UI. It doesn't allow uh, convenient uh, hardware wallet integration from the UI, uh, but it does have a ton of features from, from the command line. So it's very powerful. Uh, it's the most popular and probably most tri uh, reviewed and secured software in at least in the Bitcoin space, if not one of the, the most secured software in the world. So yeah, it's, it makes a lot of sense to use that. But the, again, the, the graphic UI, uh, the user interface is very, very limited for a few reasons. Uh, but then what, what Spectre does, it just connects to it, to the, uh, RPC server. So basically the, the, all the backend functionality of, of Bitcoin Core. And it just uses that for its, uh, for most of the things, for most of the operations, uh, I would say. Uh, and gives you just a, a, a much, uh, easier to use interface. So it gives you, uh, an interface with where you can use, uh, hardware wallets, uh, multi-sig, um, whatever you want, uh, basically. So it just, to, to make things easier for the user to use their own node. Aha. Uh -huh. So maybe to summarize that the Bitcoin core is this RPC server, which is basically the very powerful way to tell the software what to do. Right. Um, mm -hmm. and there are different ways to use the RPC server, right? The first and most powerful way would be via the command line interface at right, the Bitcoin core offers. Mm -hmm. That gives you a, a vast amount of, of like fine tuning and how to use the Bitcoin core client. And the other alternative would be to use the uh, Bitcoin QT graphical user interface. And, and as you said, that is a bit limited in scope, uh, and cannot do all the things like hardware wallets. Um, so it, it can only do a subset of the RPC server. And so what you guys at Spectre basically did was to create a new user interface project, uh, that uses the Bitcoin RPC server kind of as a drop in replacement for the Bitcoin QT, uh, user interface. Mm -hmm. Yeah, more or less so. Okay, that's interesting. So, so that's how you connect to using all the Bitcoin Core features. But what features specifically do you use? So, for example, like, uh, how do you actually create a wallet with Spectre? How does that work? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you create a wallet in the background, we create a wallet on the Bitcoin Core node. So we use the feature from, of Bitcoin Core to, uh, basically create and manage uh, a wallet and Spectre just does all, all the RPC calls for that. Uh, it makes sure that Bitcoin Core loads the wallets, uh, when you, when you use it. 
Um, and also it makes sure for, for example, single sig, you can create, again, it's, it's not very convenient, but you can create from the uh, graphic UI. Uh, multi sig, for example, you, you can't really do. So again, this is something that, uh, you can do with the Spectre UI, but not with, uh, core UI, at least for now. Um, yeah, so basically Spectre is just using Bitcoin Core's, uh, RPC and, you know, all the, all the background functionality and just, uh, gives you another interface for that. Aha. Uh -huh. So, so Spectre itself doesn't really generate or store the private keys or sign transactions with them. Because all, all that happens actually on the Bitcoin Core client wallet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the public keys or the, the private keys are either if, if it's a hot wallet, then it's on Bitcoin Core. If it's uh, a hardware wallet or something, then obviously on the, on the hardware wallet. Uh, and, but then, yeah, uh, public keys and stuff like that will let Bitcoin Core manage all this stuff. Uh -huh, that's very interesting. And of course, that gives you all the high review and security of the Bitcoin Core wallet itself. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but does that also kind of improve the security of, uh, the, the uh, scenario where Spectre would get attacked and get malicious uh, because it does not have the private keys itself? Uh, would that make it more secure? Um, so against the hot wallet, uh, not really, because if, if you're running something on uh, malicious on your computer, then it, it usually, uh, will be a problem. Uh, I mean, you can encrypt the, the private keys of, of the hot wallet. Uh, but then again, it, it kind of depends where the, the vulnerability is, I would say. But with, uh, if, if Spectre is, is again, is malicious and you're using uh, a cold storage, like a hardware wallet or, or just an airgun computer or something, then Spectre, the, the maximum damage that Spectre could do is leak privacy, but it cannot touch funds in that way. Yes. Right. And maybe to, to say in a different way is that, uh, even though Bitcoin Core has all the secrets and the public keys, right? Spectre has access to Bitcoin Core. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, because, uh, like, even though Spectre does not have the private keys itself or the public keys, it can talk to Bitcoin Core and has the access credentials to that. Um, so maybe let's talk about how that is actually secured. Like, how do you uh, use the RPC password or, or ways to have a secure connection to your Bitcoin Core node? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we just use the, the RPC uh, authentication method uh, that Bitcoin Core provides. Okay. Uh, so w w does that mean that it kind of limits me to uh, giving other people access to my full node via Spectre? Or like, can there be that one person hosts the full node and multiple Spectre users have their own independent wallets in there? Uh, it kind of limits you because user management would, would then be tricky. Uh, you can do that if, if it's somebody that you trust, like a close family member or something, then we do have some, um, some multi-user mode. For that, for that stuff, if you want to share it with close uh, friends or family that you trust, but it it would be problematic to share it with with somebody you don't really trust. So it's not like a, a public node. It wouldn't be. Uh, we want to explore something like there is this uh, project uh, Bitcoin Proxy, if I remember correctly, which does uh, user management and authentication uh, and stuff like that on top of Bitcoin Core. So we want to uh, uh, research integrating that, but we still didn't go to it yet. Oh yeah, that's a very interesting project uh, to get user accounts working directly on a full node. Uh, that will probably make a lot of things possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So we we really want to to check that. I started playing with it recently, but I just didn't have the time yet to fully deep dive into it. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, how, and then actually, how does the wallet synchronize the consensus? How does that work in Bitcoin Core to find out how much money is on your wallet? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you add a wallet, you, if, if it's, uh, an old wallet, then you need to rescan the blockchain. Uh, basically what Bitcoin Core does is just pass through the, uh, the history of the, of the transactions and try to find what, what belongs to your wallet. Uh, if it's an, something new, if it's like a new wallet, then it will just, uh, because it has the wallet already and it knows what to look for, 
then every uh, incoming block it will search if there are any relevant transactions and will save them if if there if there are any. Um, so that's basically how how it works. There is also the option of uh, we also allow from Spectre to rescan just the UTXO set. Uh, this is especially useful for um, for pruned nodes because then you don't you don't have the full history. But also for for regular full nodes, it's just because it's uh, much faster. So instead of going through the entire uh, history on the blockchain, you if you're just interested about your current balance, so you don't care about the wallet histor full history, you just want to see your current balances uh, and be able to, to spend that, uh, then you can rescan just the UTXO set and find any transactions there that belong to you. And that's uh, a lot faster. Yeah, a lot faster. I just compare the size of the blockchain since Genesis block. But probably you don't even have to rescan everything from Genesis block because you're not yeah, Satoshi, yeah. right? But that <laughs> that would be what 400 gigabytes closely or something. While the UTXO mm -hmm. set is five or six gigabytes. Yeah, something like that. Uh, something like that. Yes. Yeah. So um, you you uh, wouldn't need to to rescan uh, if we the default rescan at least in Spectre is from the first segwit um, first segwit block which is. Uh, 480,000 something, I think, uh, if I remember correctly. But again, this is, uh, where most of the, the actions did. Uh, so, uh, where most of the action was. So even though it's less than, uh, it's technically less than half of the blockchain, it's still a lot more to, to risk and that because the blocks were much uh, larger and fuller. Oh, that's interesting that you do this because Wasabi does the same. Uh, we only scan up uh, after um, uh, like SegWit. But the reason why Wasabi can do this is because we only support native SegWit addresses. So mm -hmm. legacy addresses are not supported and mm -hmm. therefore it doesn't make sense to search old blocks. Yes, uh, but, yes. But For Spectre I, too. Actually. Spectre is only SegWit. It's only uh, SegWit and nested SegWit. So we we do support the, the nested SegWit, but we don't support legacy. Uh, there was just uh, not enough demand for that, and I don't see a reason going forward for people to need that uh, if they can use the nested SegWit. So I think SegWit adoption would, would just make more sense. And in terms of people with old wallets which want to, to migrate, then there are we just didn't get enough requests for that, I'd say. So not enough people who really are in still using legacy and want to move. Aha, uh -huh. I see. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, and you know, with with a new wallet project, I, I guess the best part of the user base will create a new wallet rather than import an old one. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, good, good that you focused on that. And I assume just being SegWit only will make your logic in the wallet a lot easier. Uh, because you don't have to deal with all the edge cases of legacy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, cool. That's uh, that's very interesting. Uh, so let's talk about the the other thing that uh, Segwit, uh, <laughs> sorry, that Spectre offers, and that's of course the multi signature. Uh, and one of the interesting concepts that I found that you use was this concept of signing devices or signers. Uh, can you speak a bit more about what that actually means? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So with, uh, with hardware wallets, basically, which, which is what most people, uh, use today, uh, I think. So with hardware wallets, the, the concept of the hardware wallet, so the name is, is quite confusing because, uh, then if you have this wallet, then why you need this software also? So it's important to understand that the hardware wallet isn't exactly a, a wallet. It's more of just the, uh, device where the signing occurs. So you have the, uh, the private keys, which are basically your, your seed words, your pass, uh, your, uh, seed words for the, the 24 words, basically. Um, and you have the, uh, the cold card, the, uh, beatbox, the whatever, which is, uh, the device where you enter these seed words and you use it to sign transactions. And then you have the software wallet, which you use to watch your balances and to create transactions and to uh, send them out to the network. So there are kind of three things here. There are the private key, there is the signing device, and there is the uh, wallet, I'd say. Yeah, that's a very interesting differentiation. Right? And uh, if 
if the wallet would only be a software wallet, right, a hot software wallet, then probably not even needed to think about it in that way. But yes, as soon as we speak about hardware wallets and also multi-signatures, that really comes in as an aspect. So uh, how do I create a new wallet, both a single SIG wallet and a multi-SIG wallet in this signer concept? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you have basically the, the, uh, the way that it works in Bitcoin is that you have, uh, the master public key. So your, uh, your private key is generating, uh, a public key from which you generate other pub, uh, public keys. Uh, and, f uh, you can use each one in, in any setup that you want. So there is, uh, a default way on, on how to, like a standard way on how to generate, uh, uh, the public key which will be used in uh, a multi-sig or the public key which will be used in a single sig uh, from these you also generate like uh, individual public keys which will be used for each uh, for each address but uh, i think we can ignore that for a moment so the way that it works is that after you have you have your your wallet your uh, your private key uh, from that you generate these uh, public keys uh, based on the standards so you use each public key for uh, every wallet that that you use. So you don't mix between them. You don't leak uh, any connections between them. Uh, when you're using, for example, the same device in in a multi-sig setup in and a single-sig setup, um, and it also uh, yeah. So it also helps recovery with with the standards. Uh, just to make sure you know, uh, you clearly separate everything and all wallets know how to, how to recover from that. Um, yeah. So that's, that's basically how you do this. Um, you generate, or you take all these, uh, public keys and from that you generate an address. You, you bring up the point that a user could use the same signing device in both a single SIG wallet and a multi SIG wallet, uh, or even just two independent single SIG wallets. How do you deal with public key reuse and address reuse? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as I mentioned, you can uh, create multiple uh, uh, master public keys, let's call it, from uh, multiple XPUBs from the same uh, master or XPUB. So the it's basically a hierarchy like like a tree. So you have the root, like the master uh, public key. From that, you can derive other public keys, uh, which you can derive from them other public keys, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so there is basically just a standard way how to derive this stuff. And if you want to, to derive, uh, a public key to use for, for a single SIG wallet, then there is the standard way to do that. And the standard way also allows you for, to, to use what's called, uh, accounts. So you can uh, have multiple wallets, uh, multiple single SIG wallets, multiple multi SIG wallets, and each has its own uh, master public key, uh, which makes sure that you generate uh, dedicated addresses, dedicated public keys uh, for each uh, use case. So it it will never be uh, the same. Basically, it will never get. Uh, um, you will never use the same uh, public keys for for the same wallet. Basically. Yeah, that's a very, wallets, yeah. yeah, that's a very interesting solution, right? And, and, and it works and it has a nice benefit that you have like this one static, uh, backup, right? Your 12 or 24 recovery words leads you to your master private key. And from there, mm -hmm. you can get all the different sub accounts, uh, in this hierarchical deterministic wallet. But then the question remains, right? How do you later find out which paths you use? Because all of these paths are not part of the 12 or 24 recovery words. And so how do you deal with backups in these advanced use cases? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the simplest thing with is just the first uh, line of defense, let's call it in making sure that the user doesn't lose his funds because of uh, not knowing the derivation path is just the standard derivation paths. So there is the standard way to, on how to derive uh, a single SIG wallet or a multi SIG wallet. Also depends on, on which, uh, script type. So which, uh, type of wallet and wallets just know, uh, where to look at. So when you use your 12, uh, 12 words, 24 words, uh, then the wallets know where to look for, for your funds by default. Um, and then there is, so 
and then you still might use uh, things that that you don't really understand uh, and might screw up yourself. Uh, if you use, for example, a very very large account number, then it's it you and and you lose it, then wallets won't be able to to locate your funds, uh, and then you might get screwed. So that's why a lot of wallets basically disable this this option to have a large account number, uh, one that is uh, impossible to look uh, to look for already. Um, in terms, so that's more or less covers a uh, single sig thing. You'd need to be very advanced, uh, I think, to, to lose funds by not knowing your single sig, um, derivation path. So to re- in order to really lose your funds, it's very, very difficult from, from that aspect. Uh, in multi sig, it's quite trickier because you need not, in order to spend from, from multi sig, you need to know the uh, the paths um, or well the, the public keys of not only your own device but also of all other devices. So that's not exactly related to the path. It I mean it could be because if you don't know the path on how to derive from a master public key of one of your counterparties, then again you're in the same problem. But this is also about backing up the uh, just the public keys themselves. So just b- about backing up the experts themselves. Uh, if you don't know the counterparty, uh, let's say you have um, a two of three multisig and you lose one of the public keys, then you even if you just lose the, the information about one of them, then you you won't be able to sign even though it's a two of three multisig. Uh, even if it would be a one of three multisig, you'd still not be able to to sign transactions uh, because you need all the public information and the quorum of the private information basically. Um, so yeah, so you, in, in terms of backup, you would have to, in multi C, you would have to make sure to backup all the public information in order to be able to spend. Yeah. Why is that actually that we, that you need the entire public information again, like, uh, basically the entire script? Uh, why is that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So in order to spend from Bitcoin address, you need to provide, uh, not only the, the, uh, signatures, you need to provide the entire script for, for the transaction. Uh, so when you lock Bitcoin, when you send Bitcoin to someone, you're basically locking it. Uh, and you, first of all, you need to provide the, uh, the actual conditions from, for what's locking the Bitcoin. So you need to provide, uh, you, when you send the Bitcoin, you provide the hash of how to spend it. So you don't provide the, the actual terms for spending it. And when you want to, to actually spend that Bitcoin, you need to provide both the terms on how it would be spent and the, um, so both the terms of how it will be spent and the actual signatures. So f- also fulfill those terms. Uh, so the terms are basically the public information, uh, are the, all, all the, um, all the keys that can sign the, the transaction. If we're talking about multisig, it's, it's just all the keys that are signing the transaction on the public keys. And then the private information that you need to provide is the signatures of at least such, such and such, uh, private keys. Uh, but the, um, the co-signers list, so the list of uh, those who can sign the transaction, you need to provide all of them because you need to provide the entire um, the entire um, script that com- um, that corresponds to the hash which was submitted to the blockchain first. Aha! Uh-huh. Right. So first, uh, when you want to receive Bitcoin, you already have to commit to a certain spending condition, right? Who can mm-hmm. spend the coin later? Uh, but yeah. you don't exactly say the spending condition. You really just commit to it with this hash. And then mm-hmm. later, uh, when you want to spend it, well, you have to reveal what you actually committed to in the first place so that people can verify that what was committed to before on who can spend the Bitcoin is actually being upheld and, and verified in that transaction. Yep. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Cool. Uh, so. Uh, like as I said, uh, Spectre can create these hot wallet signers, basically, where the private keys are generated and stored on the Spectre wallet. Uh, does that also work in an air gapped mode so that I can install Spectre completely or and run it completely offline just to do this signing on a device mm-hmm. that is not connected to the internet? 
Yes, yes, absolutely. You can, uh, you'll still need to, to have Bitcoin Core there, but it can be completely out of sync. Uh, it won't matter. So just because Spectre uses Bitcoin Core as its backend for wallets and stuff. So you install Bitcoin Core, you install Spectre there. Uh, you can do, do this, uh, both, you know, air gapped and yeah, you, you will be, uh, good to go. So you don't need to sync them or, or anything like that. Okay. That's very nice. Uh, but, but as you bring this up, one more question, uh, about the installation process. So does the user first have to manually install Bitcoin Core and then manually install Spectre separately? Uh, so right now, yes. So you can either connect to your existing Bitcoin Core, um, that, that you have or set up a new one. Uh, the, the next thing that, uh, will be in the coming release, probably tomorrow. Uh, is that we'll have Bitcoin Core installation from Spectre. So we will allow to the user to just click uh, in Spectre and it will download Bitcoin Core, verify the signatures, uh, set up the configuration file and, and make sure to run it. Uh, also, we will allow that to be used uh, as with, with uh, like a trusted uh, snapshot. So we have this uh, website called prunenode.today. Uh, which allows you to download uh, a pruned, basically just a snapshot from, from a pruned node. So what is the current status of the network? Uh, this allows for a very, very quick setup. So just a few minutes if you have a good internet connection. But it's obviously it's less good because it's trusting, uh, so that so far the information is correct from, from what Spectre, uh, well, what the snapshot gives you. Uh, but again, if you just want to play with it or something, then it also uh, does the job. What does the snapshot actually contain? Yeah, it just contains the, the all the data folder of, of Bitcoin Core from uh, a pruned node which we are uh, running, so which uh, Stepan is mait- maintaining. Um, okay, why a pruned node and not only the UTXO set? Yeah, the a prune node is just, it's almost only the UTXO set. So it has a very small, uh, small set of blocks. So it's pruning, uh, almost anything. And it's, yeah, it's just the same and it's easier to, to get it to work with Bitcoin Core. Aha, uh-huh, I see. Um, so nearly all the data is, is the UTXO set. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's interesting. And then does the Spectre client continue to verify the entire chain afterwards? Uh, currently no. So it's, it's a bit of a problem. Well, afterwards, uh, you mean after the, um, uh, after that point? So after the point of the snapshot or what was before that? Uh, so uh, I'm asking because the way the, or there is this Bitcoin Core assume UTXO command, mm-hmm. right? Where, yeah. where you can assume only the UTXO set. And mm-hmm. you just verify after that snapshot, like a regular Bitcoin full node does. Yes, yes, right? yes. It's, but, it's practically an, I uh, assume you take so, uh, implemented outside of Bitcoin core. Aha, uh-huh, I see. Um, but then what assume you take so does, if I understand correctly, it, it in parallel still goes back to the Genesis block and verifies all the old blocks until it reaches that snapshot of the assume you take so. And then it really mm-hmm. knows that yes, everything was valid. Yeah, yeah. So that is still not supported. I want to to do that next. Uh, it just more work because well, now we will need to run Bitcoin Core in another process and make it you know uh, sync it meanwhile, and then just transfer the the state or at least verify the state after it finishes syncing. So it's we're kind of replicating uh, UTIC. So I assume UTIC so outside of Core uh, in that way. But yeah, so right now it's, it still won't do this, uh, verification from Genesis, but I hope in the next version or so we will, uh, add that too. Okay. That's interesting. Um, you know, why, but why, why again did you like try to reinvent the wheel here basically, uh, and not use assume UTXO? It's it because Assume UTXO is not available yet. Uh, it's a proposal, and I think it's it's worked on. I'm not sure about the progress right now, but uh, it's it's a proposal, but it was never really implemented yet. Ah, I see. Okay, I actually yeah. thought it was in already. 
No, if, if it was in, then we would uh, surely use it. And if whenever or if and whenever it will be in, then we will drop our solution and move back to it. Uh, but at least for now, because it's it's just not there, then we have to use our own thing. Okay, okay, I see. Yeah, that's smart. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's maybe get a bit back into the backup situation uh, for the multi-signature case, uh, because I know that Spectre provides uh, like backup file in in the GUI. So how does that actually work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the backup file, uh, basically, the, or the, the minimal version of it provides just the, um, the name of the wallet, the date of the first transaction. So, uh, sorry, the block of the first transaction that you made with it. Uh, so it's easier to, to rescan. So you don't need to rescan from the first segwit block, but you can just start from there. And it provides the descriptor. So. Which, uh, yeah, sorry. So which, uh, so the descriptor is basically, um, the description of the public keys and the spending conditions, I'd say. It's a way, it's like a format to, to, uh, explain to wallets, uh, how the, how the bitcoins are unlocked, basically, uh, which is a lot more human readable and easy to work with than, uh, actual scripts. Yeah, output script descriptors are really fascinating. Um, just mm -hmm. last episode, uh, I spoke about this with Andrew Chow. Uh, so for, for listeners, go back and catch more on the latest here. Uh, but w one follow up question on this is, do you provide the output script descriptor of every output that was ever used in this backup file? Or do you put the public, uh, like the extended public key no. and only give mm -hmm. one output file? Yeah, yeah, it's just the, uh, the one output file with the master public keys. Okay. And so even in a multi-sig setting, right, uh, you just have one line of gibberish basically that you can somebody <laughs> can read. Uh, and that tells you exactly where all the coins are. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. It's clear. Does it also catch, for example, the change outputs and things? Uh, the change outputs are basically, so they are just, uh, with, uh, yeah, so the, the thing is that the master public key, uh, you don't derive from it exactly, like not directly from that, but you first append to it whatever it is, uh, change address or not, and just then you derive the actual key. Uh, so basically the, the same descriptor will, will provide us with both, uh, things. Cool. That's awesome. Uh, and do you provide both uh, or so, yeah, in the multi-sig case, this is only a, a viewing descriptor, right? There are no private keys inside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, output descriptors could be used also with, with private keys. But yeah, for, for backup stuff, it's only the, the multi-sig, uh, the, sorry, it's only the public key. If it's a single-sig hot wallet or even a, a multi-sig hot wallet, uh, do you provide the private keys in the output script descriptor backup? Yeah, so if it's um, a single SIG and not uh, not a hot wallet, then there is we're not uh, we're never touching the, the private keys, so we can't do that. And so uh, of course we don't uh, have the pub, uh, the private keys. So and because uh, the everything is standardized, then there is not um, a very good reason I would say uh, for most users to back up uh, a single SIG uh, descriptor. Uh, I mean, you can do that, but it, because everything is standardized across, across everywhere, then there's not much point. Uh, you probably will never need the, the output descriptor. Um, for the, the hot wallet, uh, we're right now also working. So we have the outside contributor, which is, uh, working on that, uh, to, to improve the backup for, for the hot wallet. So right now it's just the, uh, you have, you need to first of all back up the, uh, 12 boards, 24 boards, so the, the big 29 basically. Um, but yeah, we, we want to, to improve on how we handle that too. So, uh, we are, we're working on that currently. Okay. Really cool. Now these backups are of course, uh, sensitive information, right? Sometimes they even have private keys, but at least they have the public keys. So the person who reads this information finds out how much money you have, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Do you do you have some implementation of automatic encryption for this backup file? Um, no, currently no. 
uh, I want to maybe have uh, allow the users to store it on on some cloud encrypted. Uh, maybe that I mean that's an integration which I think would be interesting. Uh, but right now we still didn't go to it yet. Yeah, I think this is this is for example one of the cool features of uh, the cold card. Right, you can get a backup file with even the private keys, right? But it is encrypted with a strong password generated by the hardware device itself. And so it's, you know, it's a strong random number generator. Uh, and mm -hmm. that has nice benefits. But or, or as you say, for example, Phoenix Wallet does these backups to the cloud encrypted with the 12 words of your uh, recovery words, right? So uh, there are cool ways that you can improve UX here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. This is, uh, all. Uh, I'd say very interesting. Uh, we just didn't get it yet, but I'm definitely looking to it. Write more, better code faster now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. It will be released in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe let's let's start breaking down that that final point. Although we mentioned it a couple times already, but uh, hardware wallets are nicely integrated in Spectre. Uh, how does that work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, if you mentioned Andrew Cho, then he also uh, made the, this tool called HWI. So it's a project to allow connections uh, of, of hardware wallets, uh, basically, and convert the, them to something which is called PSBT, which is also being working on. So you you have this, this basically, I think they also have uh, some basic interface, like some QT. Uh, but it's mostly a command line tool, uh, which is used in order to communicate with hardware wallets. So there is the PSPT, the partially signed Bitcoin transaction standard. Uh, and that's something which, which Bitcoin Core supports and which is easy to work with. A lot of hardware wallets also support that, but not, uh, com not all of them and not directly at least. Um, so the HWI tool allows you to communicate with, uh, with hardware wallets. Uh, in basically in an easy way. Uh, I think that the intention is to now allow integration with Bitcoin Core GUI directly. So it won't be exactly included within Bitcoin Core, but you will be able to run that and kind of connect it to, to Bitcoin Core, uh, by choosing uh, a software that you would like to use for, uh, for external signing. And then, uh, and then it, you will be able to select this HWI tool. But you know, I, I think I'm pretty sure they don't want to, to connect it very much directly. So more kind of indirectly. Uh, but so far, uh, yeah, so far it, um, it was mostly used by projects like, like Spectre, uh, as a way to communicate. I also think Wasabi does that, right? Yes. Yeah, so it just to basically to communicate with with the hardware wallets. Yeah, it just it's a phenomenal tool that makes it so much easier to integrate hardware wallets into a wallet, because you don't have to worry about every driver of every niche case, uh, hard, uh like hardware wallet out there, and updating into each firmware pain in the ass. <laughs> so here, yes, on, yes. only Andrew Chow has that pain in the ass, <laughs> <laughs> and we are the benefit from it uh, by not having to worry about it. Yeah, that's, that's nice that it really helps you, uh, to like integrate all types of hardware wallets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a very, very great tool. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's been really useful for us. We just, uh, basically we just integrate it with Spectre and we are, we're able to support, uh, especially because it, it supports all the standards that Bitcoin Core supports. So PSPT and, and, uh, descriptors. Uh, so it's, it makes it, very, very easy for us to use. Yeah, you position you positioned yourself in a nice way downstream of a couple powerful software projects. Yeah. Uh, Bitcoin Core is like hundreds of rockstar developers basically working for you <laughs> because <laughs> you end up using Bitcoin Core in HWI. And so that's uh, yeah, that's a smart move for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a pretty good move. Yeah, great. Um, you you guys are also tinkering on your own hardware wallet, right? and that's a really really promising project too because it's a hardware wallet designed to be easy to build by others just by purchasing general computational devices. And so, tell me a bit more about the Spectre Do It Yourself hardware wallet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the Spectre Do It Yourself uh, wallet is basically a project which uh, mostly Stepan is working on. 
Um, and yeah, it's just, you, you can basically order a, spe uh, a specific, uh, board from any kind of, uh, store that, that's, uh, selling it. So it's, uh, it's, uh, offered by a lot of, uh, electronic providers. It's just generic hardware. Um, you can also use it with some, either with, uh, just connecting it directly or air gapped with an SD card or with a QR code scanner. Uh, and then you basically, the, the QR codes, the SD card is, is part of the, um, of the, uh, board itself. So it's part with, with the screen and everything. The QR code you need to purchase additionally, the scanner, uh, which again, it's, it's just generic hardware. Uh, you, you can order this in generic hardware store. Uh, and then you just kind of, uh, put them together. So there's no soldering needed or something like that. You just kind of, uh, if you want to, to make it yourself like this, then you just take a few like these small pins and connect it uh, together, and you have this your own your own hardware wallet basically, uh, just from generic components. Now, I mean, this seems like a lot of trouble to go through. Why would someone do this themselves? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the main reason I'd say to to choose a do-it-yourself hardware wallet is supply chain attacks. Uh, the second reason I think that a lot of people want to do this just because it's really, really cool and it's really, really fun project. So if you do this over the weekend, it's a lot of fun. Uh, maybe not for a lot of normies, but a lot of Bitcoiners, uh, find it very, very much fun, uh, project. And it's, it gives you more security uh, against supply chain attacks, of course. Um, and it gives you, I, I think the, this, uh, do it yourself project is, is also a great project that you can contribute to and, uh, help, help, help uh, scratch your own itch. So it would be, I think it would be harder with the, uh, custom, and um, so with the, um, uh, more, you know, more, uh, consumer, uh, focused hardware wallets. Uh, but yeah, with, with Spectre, we, we have, uh, also it's, it's focused, it's Bitcoin only, of course. So it only focuses on that. And it allows you to, to just move faster with more advanced features like, uh, Taproot, which is, uh, uh, sorry, um, not, not, uh, um, sorry, uh, Miniscript. I'm, I confused the name, sorry. Uh, so it allows you to, to, for example, Miniscript that it's, it's practically the only one supporting that already. Um, but yeah, a lot, it just allows you to move faster with stuff. Yeah, that's, that's kind of nice. This, uh, somewhat reckless approach, right? To, to be fast <laughs> on, on good features, right? On features that, where the feature itself is not new, right? Uh, mm -hmm. but uh, where, where it has a, a lot of research, like Miniscript. I mean, fascinating project. Again, we talked about it last week, um, with Andrew. Um, so, so go back and check out that episode. Uh, but, yeah, it's it's amazing to see that Sepan just hacked it together, and the Spectre Do It Your Self Kit can now like tell the user exactly what the signing conditions are in a very intuitive uh, and humanly understandable way that that's verifiable. That we know that there isn't a bug in the Bitcoin script, and it's even as optimized and efficient as it could be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a really exciting thing. W when do you see a, a mini script coming to Spectre Desktop Wallet? Yeah, so with Spectre Desktop, it would be, uh, much more work, I'd say, uh, because uh, it's, it's quite tricky to, to integrate this with Bitcoin Core, because Bitcoin Core doesn't support Miniscript, uh, directly at least yet. Uh, it does support output descriptors, but output descriptors are, um, more of a subset of, of Miniscript, so they are, they don't support the full functionality. Um, yeah, so, if uh, Bitcoin Core uh, supports Miniscript soon, then it will, it will be much easier for us to integrate, and then it will probably be much faster. But if not, then it will probably take uh, quite some more some more time. Yeah, that's maybe again the downside of uh, you know relying on Bitcoin Core so much uh, is that often the Bitcoin Core development process is, is tediously slow. I didn't. <laughs> Again, right? If you have your own Spectre do it yourself hardware platform, you just hack it together on a weekend, right? But, uh, <laughs> for, for Bitcoin Core, for, for good reasons, right? It will take, uh, it will take quite some more time, uh, and nuance. 
of well but again that that is where i know you guys are also you know contributing back to the upstream platforms and then to mm -hmm. to help review and develop these features in bitcoin core because ultimately you will end up using them and so that is a very much well invested time mm -hmm. yeah yeah so we we uh, uh we contributed a few uh things to hwi for example uh with bitcoin core it was uh we we found for example well our users uh, more correctly found some issue uh also for example and one of them actually fixed it so and just something with uh with pre-scanning so when you rescan the the wallet uh then you uh sorry when you rescan the wallet twice uh if you used the first time a uh, too high uh block number then it will just it will never be able to uh to get uh, to write a block number which is uh higher than which is lower than that sorry so yeah, it's kind of a very much of an edge case but it's it's something that was kind of uh not working as expected i'd say in bitcoin core and it's it's really it was really awesome to see that uh we we were able to to find that and that one of the uh guys that was was having this bug actually fixed it yeah yeah that's that's very nice again right when when relying on uh downstream and upstream dependencies on free software and contributing back to them it just benefits uh the, the vast amount of people like all those who use bitcoin core who maybe not even know about the rescan feature at all right but still they mm -hmm. benefit yeah yeah exactly you know speaking of, of future tech magic that uh, you might implement uh what are your thoughts on on taproot in general and how it will affect spectre yeah, so I think, uh, Taproot is really, really interesting. Uh, the thing is that it will, uh, for it to be really useful, it will probably need to be supported by all the hardware wallets. And until, uh, it, it can take some time, you know, it can take some time for, for them, at least for the very major hardware wallet providers to, to move with that stuff. Um, so even when it's uh, available, then at first it will probably not be too useful uh, for for most of the users because hardware wallets will need to move first. But I think eventually, uh, as as uh, they do, then it will be, of course, I think a major improvement for for multi-sig privacy um because just because it allows you to hide in 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 the bigger crowd of um a normal bitcoin transaction so uh, yeah so just taproot can can make uh, multisig look like a, a normal bitcoin transaction uh but yeah this this stuff will just take a lot of time so i am very excited about it but i'm also kind of uh, it's kind of annoying that it will, uh, even when it reaches the, the network, it will take so much time to actually use it. Yeah, that's true, right? For, for one, it took a while to research it. Now it's taking a long while to activate it. And, and then even after it's activated, uh, it will take a long while to implement it in all the downstream dependencies of Bitcoin Core, like mm -hmm. the hardware wallets and such. Um, I, I would guess that a lot of the work can be done in, for example, you know, HWI. But where do you see that the hardware wallet providers still have to update their firmware? Like, to what extent is that upgrade, if you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they they will have to allow users to verify addresses which are um, which are taproot uh, scripts. Uh, they'll have to allow uh, so both single sig and multi sig. Um, they'll have to support that. They will have to support the uh, protocols uh like like music if we want to to see that then they will have to to allow uh to basically to be able to to participate in these protocols and be able to analyze the scripts in order to provide the users with the with the secure information um they will have to be able to derive uh, basically everything and verify the that uh all all the participants so verify the change address is is correct it, it verify that the uh sending uh they can display the right address where it's actually being sent to so it's just uh a lot of stuff like or well it depends but it can be quite some work on their side too yeah that will be interesting to coordinate right and again um hardware wallets are especially useful in multi-signature setups and tamproot is especially useful there too 
So mm -hmm. hopefully the incentives will align to, to you know, will work towards a swift integration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, I, I hope so. I know Spectre DIY would be, be, uh, probably one of the first there. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that cold card will move fast on that. I'm quite confident in them. And I hope also, uh, others will, will do the same. Yeah. Well, I think here it shows now again, right? Which, which hardware wallet team is wasting their time on shitcoins and which are <laughs> actually sticking to important, to solving important problems in Bitcoin. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. definitely uh, an advantage for Spectre and cold card. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So Bitcoin only strategy is very, very useful in that sense. Yes. Yes. Uh, because already that is difficult enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For sure. Uh, how about like the flexibility of what multi-signature schemes I can set up? Like, is there a limit to the threshold uh, th that you are now using, Inspector? Um, so we, the limited threshold is basically that we allow is 15 because that's what Bitcoin allows. So you can't make multi-sig uh, that is bigger than 15 participants uh, just because it's too large. Uh, it's also not very recommended to use, um, <clears throat> sorry, but, um, to use more than five cosigners in a multi-sig because unless you have a very good reason, because, uh, this is considered uh, a non-standard script and a lot of, uh, mining pools will just, uh, not mine it. So they will just ignore your transaction and then it will be quite more expensive to, to spend from because uh, first, you will need a bigger uh, transaction, so you, uh, because you have more cosigners, the transaction itself will be bigger. And second, because a lot of pools will not want to to mine the transaction, then again, you you will need to to pay more to incentivize the the pools that will accept it. Um, so even though the the maximum is 15, then more than five is usually not recommended unless you have a very good reason. Oh, that's interesting. I did not know that mining pools don't mine these non-standard transactions. Uh, I mean, why? They still pay a fee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's... Uh, I'm I'm actually not even sure why they, they don't really uh, do that. Maybe because it's uh, large transactions and they don't want to, to get spammed. But I'm really not, not sure why they, uh, they do that exactly. So I, I just know that for some transactions which are considered non-standard, then not all pools will will support them. Okay, but so Spectre basically allows you to to use the full feature set of multi-signatures, right, from a one out of fifteen uh, all the way to mm -hmm. uh, I don't know a seven out of seven or whatever you can come up with. That's yeah, already whatever very you want. Yeah. Uh, do you use some other script uh, script types here too, like time logs or hash time lock contracts? Um, currently, no. So I want to add time locks, uh, but we again we didn't get to it yet. So I think time locks would be really really cool to have, but uh, in the future. Yeah, time locks was one of the things really where I was like, yeah, that makes sense. Like a multi sig time locked vault uh, is very secure. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah. of course, you know, key rotation and what happens if you lose or uh, if you leak your private keys, right? A lot of things can, can still go wrong. Um, mm -hmm. but nevertheless, uh, I think it's some, it's an interesting edge case. Uh, but, but when do you think will that come? Like, are you waiting for Miniscript for such type of implementation? I think with, with Miniscript, uh, to, to make it easier to do and with Taproot to make it more private, it will be really, really great. I think it would be a great combination. Uh, so Miniscript would make it uh, much easier to handle. Uh, I think w when it's uh, available with Bitcoin Core, then it's it's probably uh, we will probably implement it uh, very very soon. Um, and yeah, it's it just with I mean without it, then making it, we can do we can still do like simple time locks and stuff, but not very complicated scripts. Um, and again, and with Taproot, it allows you to, to hide all the, all the spending conditions, which, which you're not using. So it's, again, it's a huge benefit in terms of, um, in terms of privacy. So if you, for example, has, uh, um, a three of five multisig, which after a year degrades to a two of five, which after like five years degrades to a one of five, 
for example, then uh, Miniscript makes it much, much easier to write that uh, condition uh, securely and efficiently. And Taproot will hide everything that shouldn't be revealed to the network. So it's both privacy and simplicity. Yeah, one of the nice things also with, with Miniscript is that you can weigh the probability of actually using uh, this script. I think if, if uh, the user specifies that, yeah, in most cases, I will use this script and this other script is just a fall based condition for the edge case right, where I and everyone else gets hit by a bus, <laughs> um, <laughs> then Miniscript really allocates that efficiently, even in Taproot uh, or tap, uh, like the Taproot tree, um, which is, I think, going to be a vast improvement for both privacy and scalability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, maybe let's also finish this up with then a talk about the privacy aspect of Spectre. Uh, I mean, you spoke already that you use your own full node, right? So there, there is a lot of privacy just by you not talking to anyone else. Right? But how about, for example, the Tor integration? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So also the, the currently, uh, you have to bring your, your own Tor. Uh, you have to set it up yourself, but next version also including uh, the, the Bitcoin Core installer and the Tor uh, installer. So it will again download the Tor daemon, set it up, uh, verify signatures and run it in the background. So Spectre will be able to use that. Um, for, you know, for the uh, initial block downloading, we currently chose not to do this through Tor because it will take forever for most users. So uh, it's usually not recommended to do this through Tor unless you really have to, uh, which I don't think uh, most of the users really have to. Uh, again, just because uh, doing this through Tor will, will take uh, just way too long to, to wait. Uh, but then uh, all the other stuff uh, can be done over Tor. Um, and, you know, if you want to, to use um, some uh, for example, the, the mem, we also added mempool.fi for fee estimation. Uh, so if you want to do, to use that, uh, then we, we allow this, uh, over Tor by default. We allow, uh, price providers over Tor. So there is this, uh, service, for example, called, uh, Spotbit, uh, which provides, uh, price data from many exchanges, um, just over, over Tor. So over Tor hidden service. Uh, and public and easier to use. Uh, so we, we also have integration with that. Um, yeah. So we, um, we, we will just, uh, the next version will just make it easier to, that you don't have to kind of bring your own tour. You can just uh, get it directly from, from Spectre. Yeah. That is, that is a great addition. It's one of the things I like about Wasabi. It has Tor binaries, HWI binaries, and Bitcoin D binaries just packaged already, right? And every user mm -hmm. has it. A similar way with you, just having it in the installation wizard. Um, that's that's really smart. Uh, that provides a lot of UX improvements where the user doesn't need to worry about downloading, verifying, installing, and configuring uh, this weird magic uh, that is going on under the hood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You you mentioned these price providers and. This is one of the most genius economical or praxeological improvements in the Bitcoin wallet space that I've seen in since forever. And that is that you actually have multiple, um, like, uh, the price of Bitcoin denominated multiple other assets, right? Or in other ways, the price of many assets denominated in Bitcoin. So for example, you can see how many stakes your stash of Bitcoin is worth. I mean, that's genius. Why did you implement that? Why did you come up with that? Uh, I just thought, first of all, it would be nice to, nice to see that thing. I think many people would, would enjoy seeing that. Um, and again, yes, I think Bitcoin, it's, it, Bitcoin is, is repricing everything. So tracking that with, with your wallet is, is quite, uh, quite a good way to measure how things are going. Now, where do you actually get the data of how much Bitcoin does one stake cost? Yeah. So right now we're try we're just, I'm still trying to, to find like how to, how to parse this data automatically. Right now, uh, you'll just need to enter this manually. Uh, I'm still trying to find price providers for as much things as I can. So right now we have precious metals like gold, for example, uh, which you can do automatically. 
Uh, I hope to find for, for other stuff too. Uh, I'll probably have to do some conversions uh, manually, but that's not, not too bad. Uh, this, this stuff is kind of like wh when I have some free time and I want to have some fun. So, so I, I try to find this stuff. Yeah. And I both love and hate the idea. Uh, I mean, because for <laughs> one, it's like the, the Keynesian crap with, uh, having a consumer price index, right? And, <laughs> I mean, how much is, is one steak worth? Well, it depends for every merchant, right? It depends on location, mm -hmm. on quality of meat, like, and all these things. You will never find a nice index of how much is steak, uh, how much Bitcoin does one steak cost. And, mm -hmm. But nevertheless, it's fun. <laughs> yes, yes. And it shows just the, the stupidity of showing the price of Bitcoin only in the US dollar or fiat shit coins. <laughs> because the value of money is the inverse of all the prices in the economy. Right, so um, th uh, this is exactly what you show here. So I I love that aspect, uh, you know, understanding the Austrian tradition. But then, yeah, I I I, I get your misery with trying to find a price index for all these goods. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But for sure, uh, for sure, a fun thing. Um, what about Lightning Network implementation, Inspector? Is that anywhere close on the roadmap? Uh, so currently, no. I think most people use Spectre as more of a long term. So it's, first of all, it's, it's a desktop app. So, and I think when you use Lightning, you would usually want to use a mobile app. Uh, so right now Spectre wouldn't be the ideal, uh, go to for that. And there is a ton of, of awesome, uh, apps and, and work, uh, for, for, you know, for Lightning wallets. So I, don't think there is a point going there right now because Spectre, first of all, is used for usually larger funds. So, uh, lightning transactions is, uh, usually can be separated into uh, a, another wallet. Uh, second, it's, it's mostly desktop wallets. So mobile clients uh, have already a great advantage with in terms of lightning, uh, which you use some more day to day when you use that. Uh, so kind of if you want to go to a shop or, you know, just send something uh, right away uh, and you're, I don't know, you're not home or something. And the third thing, I guess, is just that there are so many great clients for that already. So we we are kind of trying to focus on, on other stuff right now. Yeah, that is probably a, a good range of prioritization. Right? First, we, we have to figure out security and, and usability on the base layer. Uh, mm -hmm. and yeah, then, uh, you know, as you said, the uh, Spectre multi-sig is usually used for larger amounts. Uh, that's just a different target audience to prioritize for. And, uh, I still think in the long run, every wallet will have to have some payment channel system. Uh, yes. just otherwise yes. feeds will destroy you. Right. But, uh, yeah, uh, it, it can be still in the future. There are other more important things to work on. Mm hmm. Have you thought about adding uh, some privacy technology like CoinJoin into your wallet? Uh, yes. So we were thinking about it and how to do this. So we were thinking maybe uh, have some PageJoin implementation in the future, first of all. Uh, having, you know, having a coin join, uh, is, you know, is tricky, uh, when all of the, or where most of the users are using hardware wallets. And it's, yeah, again, it's, it's just tricky to, to have that, uh, that way. You probably know that from, from Wasabi. Um, in the future, I hope that it, again, it's, uh, we will, we will be better, uh, especially in terms of doing it from, from hardware wallet. Uh, but again, it's just a matter of, of priorities. And right now we just didn't, uh, get to it yet. Yeah. A couple points here. Um, like with, with hardware wallets, um, the reason why coin joints were not possible in the past was because it was missing a non input ownership proof, uh, which mm -hmm. is like some, some weird, well, crypto ceremony to find out that nobody's actually lying to you and stealing from you in a coin join, uh, specifically with a hardware wallet device that does not have state, right? That cannot remember all the coin joints that it signed in the past. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, actually, Stepan, uh, together with yes, some yes. treasure contributors fixed that. Um, and, mm -hmm. In our future Wabi Sabi coin join protocol, we will actually be using this uh, non-ownership proof system in the round coordination. So at least on a protocol level, there is actually nothing in the way of coin joining on a hardware mm -hmm. wallet. 
uh, in the future. And to that UX factor, uh, because a coin join is a transaction that every user should sign at the same time, right? Roughly, maybe within a one mm -hmm. or two minutes time window. Uh, like that just doesn't work if everyone sits in front of the computer with his hardware wallet and he needs to manually click on sign, right? Mm -hmm. So there are two kind of thoughts that we have to fix it. First is, is just to have a dedicated round for hardware wallets and to increase the signing phase to a day, right? Or a week. Um, mm -hmm. and to have these long coordinated rounds, which would make that possible even in a multi-sig setting, right? If you have to travel to three different meet space locations, just to unlock your three out of five taproot spending condition, right? Mm -hmm. Um, you could do that if you have a week's worth of time, right? And, uh, so that's, that is one of the ideas. Uh, and the other is to have kind of like an automated signing process on the hardware wallet so that the user one time gives a, uh, like an agreement. Okay. I'm, I want to sign this coin join transact or any coin join transaction where I spent the money to myself, right? So it goes back to my change output or change address mm -hmm. and where the fees are, you know, not more than five Satoshis per V byte mining fee and not more than 0.003% coordination fee, something like this. And then the user agrees to these condition once, leaves the hardware wallet plugged in on the computer. And whenever the coin join is being proposed for signature and it meets these criteria acknowledged before by the user, then it signs automatically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I know Coldcloud has been working on this stuff with their HSM mode. And yeah, uh, I think, uh, yeah, it's, it was, it's been quite a while, but yeah, Stefan, uh, Stefan has been working on this, um, protocol change basically for, for these proofs, uh, which is quite cool. So in theory, yeah, right. We, we, there is no barrier technically, but, uh, still the, the protocols are not yet implemented for us to, to integrate inspector and to implement something that like that ourselves would be a uh, madness in terms of the the manpower that we currently have so yeah i think in the future it will be very interesting yeah uh, like building a new coin join protocol uh, and a client and server and all the crypto magic that is required i'm telling you it's not an easy task uh, it requires a lot of i I, I believe you yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, yeah, so, so hopefully actually, uh, we can arrange somehow a, a Wasabi Spectre hookup. Uh, th that will be really, really interesting in the future. Um, mm -hmm. well, let's, let's see where it goes. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Ben, uh, this was a really pleasant conversation so far. We really delved down into a lot of the aspects, both about why you contribute to free software, right? And specifically what you, what you do on Spectre and why this is such a fascinating project. Uh, like, is there any, any nuance, uh, any rabbit hole that we did not yet open that you would like to fall down into? Uh, no, I think, I think we are good with that. Okay. That's great. Well, then I thank you very much for coming here on the Join the Wasabikas podcast. It was a pleasure talking to you and, and really it's, it's awesome to see how Spectre is, is thriving as a rather young project, but really with, with a boatload of contributors now. Uh, and it's great that, uh, that you are so passionate about the project and really moving it forward. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. It was great to talk. Yeah.